Today, we're going to begin our exploration of a very special family of continuous probability distributions, namely normal probability distributions. So we're going to start off by talking about the standard normal distribution. In doing so, we're going to talk about what is the standard normal distribution, what are the key properties that it has, and we're going to talk about how to find areas underneath of the graph of the standard normal distribution. And in doing so, we'll be revisiting z-scores. So we're also, along the way, going to talk a little bit about continuous probability distributions and the uniform probability distribution. So first off, the normal distribution. Don't let this equation scare you, all right? So if a continuous random variable has a distribution with a graph that is symmetric and bell-shaped, we say it has the normal distribution. The equation of that bell shape, if we want to graph it, is given there. You never need to use that equation, all right? Just given there to show you that this really corresponds to an equation. So when we graph that equation, this is what we get for our normal distribution. So the curve is this bell shape and it's symmetric with the center of that bell being the population mean mu. Now before we discuss the normal distribution further, we're going to talk about something called the uniform distribution. So some properties of the uniform distribution. The area under the graph of a continuous probability distribution is equal to one. A second property is there's a correspondence between the area and the probability. So probabilities can be found by identifying the corresponding areas in the graph using the formula for the area of a rectangle. We really like the uniform distribution for this reason. Right. So what is the uniform distribution? A continuous random variable has a uniform distribution if its values are spread evenly over the range of possibilities. I mean, think about back when we were talking about shapes of histograms, the uniform distribution was the one that was pretty flat across. Right? So the graph of a uniform distribution results in a rectangle shape. So a vocab word that we use when we're talking about continuous probability distributions is something called a density curve. The density curve is just the graph of a continuous probability distribution. And any density curve must satisfy the requirement that the total area under the curve is exactly one. Because the area underneath of that density curve is one, that's why there's a correspondence between the area and the probability. So let's take a look at an example. So waiting times for an airport security, right? So during certain times of day time periods at JFK in New York, passengers arriving at the security checkpoint have waiting times that are uniformly distributed between zero and five minutes, as illustrated in the figure on the next page. So let's take a look at that figure. There it is, zero to five minutes. They're uniformly distributed. So to figure out what the height of that curve is, we're going to figure out what the width of the rectangle is between zero and five, so it's five. And then the height has to be one over five so that the area of that rectangle ends up being one. So that means the probability is 0.2 all the way across between zero and five. That's what it looks like for our equally likely waiting times. All right. So looking at this figure, we, waiting times can be any value between zero and five minutes, so it's really possible to have waiting times anywhere along the way, right? This is one of those time, even if we can't tell the difference between two times, they can be really close. Um, so there's an example of an outrageous version of that. And again, this is how we find the probability being 0.2, which is the height of the horizontal line in the picture. All right, typo there. So the enclosed area is exactly one. We basically say it's one over our range or one over how far does it go horizontally on our x-axis. 
Right. So now we want to use this figure, this illustration, this uniform distribution, and find the probability that a randomly selected passenger has a waiting time of at least two minutes. So what we do is we take our figure, we draw a vertical line at two, and at least two minutes means two minutes or more. So we're going to be looking between two and five minutes. So we take the area of that rectangle. So we'll be taking 0.2 times three for an area of 0.6. That means that the probability that a randomly selected passenger is going to have a waiting time of at least two minutes. Going back to our standard normal distribution now. So we learned through doing the stuff with the uniform distribution that the area under the density curve, which is what this bell-shaped graph is, is going to be equal to one. And the other things that make it a standard normal distribution is it's a normal distribution, that bell shape, the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So we can find these areas for the different regions under a normal curve. We don't have to use that equation again. Um, we can use technology or we can use table A2. Technology is great because it can be a little bit more accurate than the table, but the table is accurate enough most of the time. All right, so let's talk about using that table. So it's designed only for the standard normal distribution. So that's the normal distribution with the mean of zero, standard deviation of one. And you're gonna see on the pages that it has positive and negative z-scores there. So a negative z-score page and a positive z-score page. So each value in the body of the table is gonna be a cumulative area from the left up some vertical boundary above a z-score, a given z-score, and that area is going to correspond to the probability that the z-score is less than that z-score that provides the boundary. So when we're working with the graph, it's incredibly important that we avoid confusion between z-scores and areas. Remember, the areas are corresponding to the probability that the z-score is less than or equal to the given z-score, whereas the z-score itself is, are those boundary values. Right. So in the table, the column is going to be determining the hundredths place, while the row is going to be giving the ones and the tenths place. So let's take a look at an example. Taking a look at a bone density test. So a bone mineral density test can be helpful in identifying the presence or likelihood of osteoporosis. The result of a bone density test is commonly measured as a z-score. The population of z-scores is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So these test results meet the requirements of a standard normal distribution. So here's a graph of the bone density test scores as they're shown. So zero is marked there as our mean. And we want to look at a randomly selected adult who's undergoing the bone density test. We wanna find the probability that this person has a bone density test score less than 1.27. So we can mark Z equals 1.27 with a vertical line and having a bone de density test score less than that means that the z-score falls to the left of 1.27. So we're going to shade all that area to the left. So again, the probability corresponds to the shaded area because the area is the probability. The area under the density curve is the probability. So that area being 0 0.8980, which we can find from table A2, Table A2 is giving us the probability that the z-score is less than the one given. So if I look for 1.27, that z-score, the probability that is there 
from the table will read 0 0.8980, and it's telling me that's the probability, that's the area to the left of that z-score. So exactly what we have here. So we know exactly what we need. We've got our answer. It's 0 0.8980. So let's take a look at that table really quick. So 1.27. So the z-scores are given the ones place and the tenths place again is in the row, labeling the rows, and the hundredths place is labeling the columns. So looking at the row labels, we're looking for the row that corresponds to 1.2 for our z-scores. And then in that row, we're going to go over to the column that corresponds to 0 0.07 for seven hundredths. And when we do that, there's the 0.8980 that we saw as that area. So the probability that this randomly selected person has a bone density score of 1.27 or less is 0 0.8980. Or we can say that it's 89.8% of people have bone density levels below 1.27. All right, let's take a look at this same test, except we're going to be now finding the area to the right. So we're going to be taking a random person and finding the probability that that person has a result above negative 1.0. So now Z equals negative 1.0, we've marked that, and we want to know about the area to the right. So that's what's shaded here. Using table A2 A and most technologies, they're going to give you the area to the left rather than the area to the right. Lucky for us, we know that the sum of all of the probabilities, we know the total probability, the total area under that curve must be one since it's a density function. So we can take one minus the area to the left and that will give us the area to the right. So looking at the table A2, we can see that the area to the left is going to be 0.1587. So we used table A2, we looked for a z-score of negative 1.00, and we found that 0.1587. So again, using that the total area under the curve is one, we're going to take one minus, 0.1587 and give us a result of 0.8413. So that means that 84.13% of people have bone density levels above negative one and the probability of randomly selecting someone with a bone density reading above negative one is 0.8413. So let's take a look at a third example using this same bone density test. So now we're looking at readings between negative 1 and negative 2.5, which is indicating some bone loss. So finding the probability that a randomly selected subject has a reading between these two values is going to be our goal. So if we take a look at this, we know that the area to the left of negative 1 is 0.1587. We found that earlier. And if we go into table A2, we can find that the area to the left of negative 2.5 is 0 0.0062. Now, if I wanna know the area between negative one and negative 2.5, then that's going to be the difference of the two areas. It's going to be everything to the left of negative one and not everything to the left of negative 2.5. So when I do that subtraction, I find the area between. So I'll be taking 0.1587 and subtracting 0 0.0062. And when we do that, we get a probability of 0.1525. So that's the probability that a randomly selected subject has a bone density reading between negative one and negative 2.5 or 15.25% of people have this bone loss. 
So, a uh, generalized rule, right? So, whenever we're looking for the area between two z scores, we can use table A2 to help us out, right? So, it's not a great idea to memorize a rule or formula for this case. Instead, drawing the picture is always a good way to go. So we know that we want the area to the left of the larger number, and we know that we don't want the area to the left of the smaller z-score. So if we want one of them, and we don't want the other one, we're going to take the positive version of the one we want, and we'll subtract out the one that we don't want. And then we're left with what we were looking for. So just some notation for our z-scores. When we're looking for the probability that a is less than z is less than b, that's denoting the probability that the z-score is between a and b. When we're looking for the probability that z is greater than a, that's the probability that z-score is greater than a. And z is less than a, that's the probability that z is less than a. So sometimes we know the area or the probability, but we don't know the z-score that goes with it. When this happens, it's really helpful to draw a bell-shaped curve and identify the region under the curve that corresponds to the given probability. If the given probability is not a region that's a cumulative region from the left, then it's a good thing to translate it into one that is, so that we're dealing with a cumulative region from the left, because that's the way our table works. So then we're going to use technology or our table. Again, our table will be good enough here. And we're going to find the z-score. So in the table, what that means is in the body of the table, we're going to find the area that we're looking for. And when we find that probability or that area, we're going to look and see what row and what column it falls in. And that will identify the corresponding z-score. We also have critical values. So for the standard normal distribution, a critical value is a z-score on the borderline separating those z-scores that are significantly low or significantly high. Right? We've had critical values before, things that are the, the values that break the significant low versus the significant high versus the stuff in the middle that's not significant. It's the same thing here. Right? So. Whenever we're talking about z-scores, we're going to use the z sub alpha notation. So when we see this, we see the z, we should think z-score. And that alpha is the area to the right. It's weird that it's the area to the right, I know, but it's tradition that we do that even though our table and most technology is going to give us the area to the left. So let's take a look at an example of finding the critical value of z sub alpha. So finding the value of z sub 0 0.025. We're going to let alpha be 0 0.025 in this expression, right? So we're finding the value that gives us the probability to the right is 0 0.025. So in doing this, we're going to take a look at the graph here. So we have a graph, we've marked the area of 0 0.025 to the right. And at this point, we might not know what z-score it corresponds to, right? But we will be able to find it. So remember though that our normal distribution is symmetric, about zero. So the z-score that goes with having that area to the right, the 0 0.025 to the right, is just going to be the negative of the z-score that has that same area to the left. So if we look in the table, we'll find that negative 1.96 has an area of 0 0.025 to the left. And taking the negative of that, we find z equals 1.96 has an area of 0 0.025 to the right. 
Alternatively, we can know that the area to the left of whatever z-score has the area of 0 0.025 to the right must be 1 minus 0 0.025. So it must have an area of 0.975 to the left. And we can locate 0.975 in table A2 and find that the z-score that corresponds to it is 1.96. Either of those approaches for this will work for you. So whichever way feels more natural, go for it. And just a word of caution, again, it's strange that its alpha is to the right when our table is telling us to the left that there's opposite. So we can find this, we can deal with this by taking the one minus alpha for what we're looking for in the table or by taking the negative of the z-score that we find. Either way, again, works. So whatever makes the most sense to you, go for it.